Uh, so, welcome everyone to the seventh uh, webinar of our BMP section. I have the great pleasure of introducing Professor Alejandro Jara as today's speaker. Alejandro is an associate professor in the Department of Statistics in, at Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. His research interests include, but are not limited to non-parametric Bayesian statistics, MCMC methods, and statistical computing. The topic of his talk today is grid uniform copulas and rectangle exchanges, Bayesian model and inference for a rich class of copula functions. As always, you can ask a clarification questions during the presentation, and we ask you to hold all non-clarification questions uh, until the end of the presentation. So Alejandro, thank you for accepting this invitation, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming Alejandro. Well, thank you, Felipe, and, and thank, thanks the organizers for, for the invitation. It's, it's really nice to have the opportunity to talk in front of, well, in a distance way, right? <laughs> a friend, um, very good friend, so it's nice to at least have the opportunity to talk to you, you know, <laughs> um, and I hope to see you soon, and hopefully in Chile soon. Um, so, so what I'm gonna talk about is, is kind of ongoing research. So it's not something which is completely finished. So there are many things that we are actually thinking about. And this is joint work with a postdoc in our group. Uh, his name is Nicolas Kuczynski. And probably he's gonna be around soon. Um, and he's the, probably the, the artist right behind this, this particular uh, work. So, <clears throat> so the agenda of the talk is the following. So I will try to give like a sort of motivation of why we do what we do. Then I will discuss the model in, in two different phases. Uh, in the first stage, I will describe, you know, kind of a, a sort of fixed model. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create a prior that induce uh, trajectories in this particular form. And I will describe some of the properties which are very interesting in the sense of, you know, kind of um, having the ability to expand the complete space of a particular class of couple of functions. Uh, and also uh, we found like a very interesting property that allows to come up with an, an automatic MCMC algorithm, which is pretty cool, I think. Um, and then I will show you some illustrations of the use of the model and some concluding remark, which is basically the thing that we, we are thinking about right now, okay? Um, so the idea is very simple. So as you all know, one of the main interests in, statistical, in the statistical analysis of multivariate data is to study how the variables that are involved relate to each other. And a very simple way to, and flexible way to to understand and to study the association structure is to base the modeling approach in the marginal copula representation of the joint probability distribution. Uh, and because in this case, we completely can focus right on the copula function, which capture completely the information about the association structure of the values. Uh, for the ones that are not uh, familiar with the concept, the concept of copula and probably was you know defined before, but the ones that I the one that I know. Uh, it was originated by Sklar that showed that for any d variate distribution H, uh, which is in principle defined on the reals, right? Uh, and with given marginal F1 to Fd, the, co the copula function C is a function such that you can express the joint distribution H in this particular way, right? So as I said before, C, which is the copula function, uh, allowing this parameterization is, is the piece of information in the joy distribution that capture completely the, the information about the association the structure uh, of the variables that are involved. Um, so a good thing, and, and this, the focus of this talk is about continuous copula, is that Slar also proved that if H is continuous, then this representation and this copula function in this particular representation is, is unique, right? So um, a little bit of intro to the couple of functions are themselves multivariate probability distribution. They are supported on the unit hypercube and are such that the marginal distributions are uniform, 
that's kind of the properties, right? So in this particular representation of the joint distribution, we need to focus our specified model for the marginal distributions and for the couple of functions separately, right? So in principle, understanding and looking to univariate distribution is kind of very easy to do at this stage. So it's not gonna be the focus. Here we're gonna focus only on, on the estimation of the couple, right? Um, right. Um, when we have multivariate data and high dimensional, in particular multivariate data, choosing the class of copulas, copula models to use to define the joint distribution in this particular representation is not very easy. And, and there are very well known examples of how the bad use of or the bad choice of the particular family of copulas can lead to very wrong results. Uh, actually very wrong economic results in the recent past, right? Um, so because of this, different flexible approaches have been discussed in the literature, including classical and Bayesian ones. Um, the, the classical approaches, most of them rely on the use of partial or pseudo likelihood. Uh, so basically these do not allow us for the proper quantification of the uncertainties associated to the lack of knowledge of the marginal distributions. And the second problem is that we cannot therefore use this decomposition uh, in, in the context of a hierarchical model where you would like to understand the association structure of hidden latent variables that are not at the first level of the representation of the data in, in your model, right? So in the context of Bayesian approaches, uh, there are three basic, three main ideas that we found in the literature. One is very interesting is a, is a, an article by Gilot and Perron, and I, I'm really sorry if I didn't pronounce well the names, but um, they propose a very cool sem semi-parametric Bayesian approach for bivariate copulas. And, and one of the, the problems, if you wanna say, associated to this approach is that it can only be used for, for bivariate copulas. And, and one of the ideas in this particular work is try to generalize, you know, what they did. Um, so the, the, the idea behind uh, Gilot and Perron approach is to basically partition the unit interval, right, in, 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 in even, you know, sets. And, and then the copula is constructed by using uh, functions which are uh, the indicator functions of these particular intervals. And then the, the, the model is basically induced by using um, doubly stochastic, stochastic matrices. And, and, and all the theory that is behind this construction basically depends on the theory of a stochastic matrix, right? And that's kind of the idea. And as I said before, this approach is not very easy to, gener to generalize in cases where you will have a grid which is not equally spaced. In, in the first, yeah. And then to higher dimensions. This is one of the problems of the approach, but the approach is really cool. It's really interesting. And the well, idea in the paper is very nice. So you can find another, um, so another way of doing this is to, to consider the use of mixture of copulas, right? So, so so you want to model your couple of functions and, and, and in Bayesian no parametrics, we're very used to the idea of taking particular kernels and mixing them to come up with a very flexible model that is able to approximate any density usually. So a very, you know, based on this fact, uh, and a very intuitive idea would be to take, right, a, a given couple of function and mix them with respect to the parameters. And in this particular case, who in 2013 uh, proposed mixture of Gaussian copula models. And the Gaussian copula is parameterized like this. So here phi sub r is the CDF of the variant normal distribution with mean zero and variance one and covariance matrix, which is basically the correlation, a correlation matrix, right? Um, so this approach seems to be flexible because we are used to the idea that, you know, mixture of parametric models are able to basically approximate anything, but it's unfortunately, this is not the case, even though the author claims that 
based on a mixture of bivariate copulas can approximate any continuous bivariate copula function. Um, just to, have, to, to give you an idea why this is not true, and, and let's consider dimension two. And so, so the, the copula Gauss, the Gaussian copula, sorry, has the property that is symmetric with respect to the arguments. And, and therefore, if you mixed many of them, so they join, the, the, the resulting couple is gonna be symmetric too, respect to the arguments. And, and there are even parametric models which are not symmetric with respect to the arguments, right? Like the asymmetrical T copula described by uh, Church. So the author then, um, not because of this, I think, but they extended the idea to, to other classes of parametric copulas, like the skew normal, but we still don't know, you know, how good approximation properties these kind of models uh, might have, right? And then lastly, um, there is a very cool paper by, I don't know how to link, I think, and it's fair far in 2018 that employ a family of non-parametric models that we know to define a, a model, uh, to model a non uh, copula function in any number of dimensions. And they come up with a very cool algorithm, uh, which is very, very nice and very attractive. Uh, however, the, the realizations of the posterior distribution of these models are not really copula functions, so which is a kind of a problem. So, so this is uh, the context, and I hope that I'm not missing any of the, the key literature in the, the subject. Uh, I'm not talking about any of the frequencies, which are basically, as I said before, depending on pseudo likelihood and things like this. Uh, but regarding the basic ones, I think that I have tried to describe what we found at least, right? So in this setting, what we are going to try to do is to come up with, a, with an idea. And actually, we, we came up with the idea <laughs> without knowing about the paper of Perron and Guillon. So it's, then we realized that it's, it is kind of a generalization of what they did. So, but we are going to base our proposal in something that we will call the uniform couples, right? Which is very similar to what they actually um, did in this paper with stochastic matrices, right? So, and, and to define the model, I need to introduce some notation. The notation is ugly, but the idea is pretty simple. So basically we are going to start with a grid. So, so remember that the couple is defined on the uh, one zero hypercube. Right, so in the dimensional hypercube, so we're gonna define, we're gonna start with an orthogonal grid in this particular space, and we will call the grid rho. So technically, what you do is to take right a, a collection of points in any of the coordinates, and then you get the, the Cartesian uh, sets based on these points. Right, that's kind of the idea. And then and another uh, notation is that we're gonna call new uh, rho the collection of sets which are formed by, which are induced by this partition row, okay? And given a particular uh, index. And so in a particular order, and doesn't matter too much the order, but it's a particular order, okay? Now, uh, if F is a probability distribution defined of an appropriate space and B is a measurable set of the space, such that the probability distribution aside positive probability to this particular set, we will denote by F this weird symbol like the line and B to the restriction of F to the to B, right? So it's basically, uh, I don't know whether you can see my mouse, but but it's basically the, the intersection, right? So the, the, the mass assigned to the intersection and the mass assigned to the, to the set in which we are conditioning on, right? Okay, given this notation, and a probability distribution that is defined now in this um, one zero hypercube uh, or unit hypercube, it, we will call it to be, or said to be a row uniform. So it's related to the partition. If for each set B uh, in the ones that are originated by the partition uh, that have positive math, the restriction to them of F to this particular set, any of them, <clears throat> or all of them is uniform on this particular set. So I hope that it is clear. So it's basically, you have like a sort of, you know, a histogram, right? Where the mass is uniform given this particular set, but it's a multivariate, right, right uh, histogram, basically. So now the definition, uh, let rho be a grid 
in the way we define it, it's an orthogonal grid. There are many other options, but we, here we are considering only uh, orthogonal grids. Um, a distribution C, right, on, on the unit hypercube is going to be called row uniform copula if it is row uniform because it is a distribution. And also, all the marginal distributions are uniform, right, which is the constraint to, to basically be a copula, right? So now, um, what we have defined so far is, is a model which is completely characterized, right, by uh, uh, this partition row, right? And the probability is that the function C is going to assign to every set in the sets in, induced by this partition, right? And which is a finite dimensional space if the number of you know elements in 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 new are finite, right? Uh, right, which is a basically compact finite dimensional domain. So it's a parametric model in in sense given given this particular grid, but we can increase the grid as needed, right? So yeah. And now for a grid row, and if you start with a couple of function C, we will use the notation C sub row to denote the grid uniform version of C. So basically you can take any couple of function, take any um, partition and make this to be uniform in this particular set, right? Inside the particular set, but assign the probability to these sets, uh, which are basically inherited by the original couple of function uh, C. So it is very easy to see that if C is a couple of function, then C sub row is also a grid uniform couple of function. It's a couple and it's grid uniform. That's, um, and basically the CDF of the two functions coincide at the corners, right? So that define the sets. Okay, this model, which seems to be not very nice in principle because it's kind of a random histogram, if you want. Um, it has a very interesting property that is able to approximate um, any continuous couple of function if you find the right grid, right? So basically, so so let's see be an arbitrary couple of function, which is absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure. Then for every epsilon bigger than zero, there exists like a grid uniform copula D such that the Helling the distance between the two things are is smaller than epsilon, right? Which is a very, very nice property in, in principle because you can basically consider this class to be very rich, but we need to now find the ways to use it, right? Uh, which is also important is that the focus of these models is to basically understand the association structure. So it's very important for them to have, well, difficult to read, but easy to compute expressions for well-known major of associations. And for this particular model, it's kind of easy to find the expressions. And that's what I'm gonna show you <laughs> the expression here is not because I wanna follow, I don't want you to follow the notation because the notation is, is very ugly, but, but it's, it is possible to compute. It's not too difficult to compute the association uh, parameters induced by this couple of functions. So, yeah, okay. So, so now, which I think is very is something that is kind of cool. So we we found after defining this uh, family of couple of functions, we found a particular set of transformations or, or a family of transformation that is is kind of uh, able to in a way expand the space of the couple of functions which are row uniform. Um, of the same family, right? Starting from any point in the space. So if you consider the space of all row uniform couple of functions, you take one and you make a, a finite number of particular transformations that we will call rectangle exchanges. And I'm gonna explain you them. You are able to reach any other point in this particular set, which is, which is a very nice property, right? So I'm going to explain you what it is, and, and actually I will I will show you the pictures, and then I will come back to the uh, formal definition. Okay. So the idea is that you have any dimensions in principle, but left is difficult to illustrate in something that is bigger than three. 
So you take two of the coordinates, y and j, and you pick up a point uh, in, in, in row three, right? Which is the, the uh, if you remember, are the collection of points, right? That are defining uh, finally the, the, join, the, the join partition, right? X3, for example, in this figure. So you take this particular slide, right? And now we're gonna pick up uh, randomly sets, right? In, in this particular, which are rectangles, right? So we are gonna uh, find randomly some particular rectangle, to, which are the ones that are gray in this figure. Uh, basically to compute the mass that C assigned to these sets, right? And we are gonna mess around the mass. We are gonna change the mass in this particular set by epsilon, okay? That's the whole idea, right? This is kind of simple. So it's a it's a it's a two-dimensional transformation of something which is multivariate in principle, right? So what I describe in the figures, uh, formally written, <laughs> is exactly what is here. So it's a rectangle exchange is basically exactly what I, what I'm doing. We are going to define starting from C. The result is going to be called C star. We are going to pick up right two particular um, coordinates. Right, we're gonna take the point according to the other interval, or, or actually not necessarily. Well, it's not gonna be necessarily an interval, right? Uh, because if the dimension is bigger than three, but anyway. So, and when you have the slice, you define the points, right? Uh, to define this particular set, we just define the notation to identify the sets, and and the tricky thing is to find basically uh, the interval for epsilon uh, for which you can take any value there uh, and, and you get at the end of the day, a couple of functions, okay? That's exactly the, the, the idea, okay? So, some results associated to this kind of so to this type of transformation. So if G is a row uniform couple of function and, and this weird G is the resulting rectangular change of G, G is also a, a row uniform copula. A, and the tricky thing is, is to basically select epsilon in this particular interval, right? The second result is that if U is a uniform distribution basically on this, a, and the unit hypercube, and C is an arbitrary grid uniform couple of function, then the good thing is that there is a finite sequence of grid divisions and rectangular changes that will transform U into Z, okay? And if you take these two results, it's not too difficult to prove that then if you start with two couple of functions, C1 and C2 that are row uniform, then there is a finite sequence of rectangular changes in the way we define them that transform C1 into C2. So that's why I claim in the beginning that if you define the space of all a row uniform couple of functions, so, so starting with a given partition row, um, there is a set of, well, a family of transformation that is able to span the complete space, which is, which is cool. Right, um, and now I, I can tell you immediately that if you know this family transformation, then you can use them, for instance, to to propose you know movements uh, within the framework of a Markov chain Monte Carlo algorithm, right? Which is nice, and this is what we we actually uh, do. So I cannot hear anything. So I don't know how the things are going. So at least I want to know that you are listening to me correctly. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Thank you, Sonia. <laughs> so we have defined a particular class of models uh, and, and we have a study and understood some of the properties. Now we want to define a Bayesian model based on this particular class, right? Um, and then, uh, 
we will discuss how to actually do inference with this. So the first thing that we, you need to know this then is that we're gonna assume that the data is IID coming from a distribution age. We're gonna use right the, the composition, the marginal copula decomposition of the joint distribution and, and C is the copula function. And we are gonna model, right? C using a grid uniform copula function, but it's gonna be a random grid uniform copula function, right? Um, and the, the good thing about the, this kind of distribution is that the likelihood is kind of easy to write. Um, um, and it's given by this expression. And the only thing that you basically need is to find the sets where the data lives to measure this particular set using the raw uh, uniform couple of function, and then to take le the Lebesgue measure of the sets. And, and that would be E basically, right? Using the marginal distribution. So it's kind of a very easy representation um, that allow us to, to compute the likelihood, right? Or for the likelihood actually, okay? Now, how to define the prior? So there are many, many ways in which you can try to do that using this idea. Uh, and basically, because the prior is defined given the, given the partition row and the probabilities, which is a basically a simplex, right? So it's mass that some adapt to one with some restriction with respect to the margins, but that's the only thing that we need to add, right? So we propose to use, uh, to define prior models uh, using this particular expression. So what you take, what you do is to take a uh, uh, positive, parameter alpha is bigger than zero, right? Positive. And D, which is gonna be a suitable distance for probability distributions. And you take a C zero probability distribution, which is a copula. Uh, we we would like to use priors with this uh, representation, right? Or we propose to use priors with this particular representation, which looks like a Gaussian thing, right? And at the end of the day, it's gonna be something like a truncated Gaussian, right? And, and here we have the indicator and C of rho is the space of all rho uniform copula, copula models, right? So we're gonna fix rho for the moment. Uh, as I said before, many choices for the, the distance between the copula functions could be considered. Um, one choice that provides very simple interpretation of the hyperparameters that we are gonna use is the square L2 distance between the two probability distributions. Yeah, and if you use that, right, the, the prior takes this particular form, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't want you to follow all the details of the expression because you can read them. So the ideas are pretty simple. The notation is ugly because we are dealing with sets. But at the end of the day, is the sum of this right particular uh, products, right? So you have the density or basically the, the mass that C assigned to this particular uh, set, right? Uh, and the same with the, the, the distribution C naught that is gonna play a very key role in, in, and I will show you in a second. So, so the prior takes the form, as I said before, uh, as of a truncated, you know, new, let's say varied ran, uh, normal random distribution takes the form, is exactly that, center uh, at the row uniform version of C0, which is called, and um, this uh, multivariate normal distribution has precision given by alpha and the identity uh, matrix, right? So therefore, um, C0 pro plays the role of the centering parameter because it's the mean of the truncated normal, it's not the mean, it's the, well, is the mu parameter of the truncated normal, right? It's not the mean, but it's the it's located, it's around that, it's close to that, right? Um, and actually corresponds to the prior mode of the distribution, right? So so and because of this characteristic, we can now um, come up or use prior information actually to define the model, which is kind of something difficult to do with, with general models in basic statistics. And, and also alpha plays the role of a precision parameter, which is cool. We are very used to this. And when the precision parameter goes to infinity, then the prior variance right around the, the center goes to zero. And this is exactly what happens uh, here. And this is just an illustration of how, you know, uh, when the parameter alpha goes to infinity, the 
prior distribution around the true is, or sorry, not around the true, around the center in distribution is the mass is concentrating. And here you have the posterior distribution of, of points in, in the density. And they are ordered in a particular way, but it doesn't matter too much. The important is how, you know, the, 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 these lines are concentrated around the, the, the points and, and the triangles, right? Uh, that's it, right? So which is cool, we have a, a, a model which is kind of, uh, for which the hyperparameters are easy to understand. And if we have prior information, we, we can use, use it uh, when we define the prior, right? Okay, but there is kind of a problem here because it, you, you could, we're, we're using partitions. So, and, and you can already claim that we're doing something which is gonna suffer from the course of dimensionality here, because if you, the larger is the number of elements in the partition, we're gonna have a lot of parameters, right? And, and we need a lot of data to learn about them. So, so basically this prior is not, it's not forcing the model to share right information or to in, impose um, smoothness of the Coppola function basically because it's, it's yeah because there is no association structure basically right so so uh, one way to deal with this is to borrow basically the ideas that you know in special statistics have been used for a while so we take the so you take the position of the sets and you try to share the information of the sets that are close to each other right so exactly what the people in, you know, special statistics do all the time. Um, so I don't want to go into all this notation, but at the end of the day, you are going to have, uh, this is a new uh, symbol, symbol for, for, for new, uh, which is basically we're going to order in a particular way the elements of the partition, the sets of the partition. And we order them in, in, in any way, but the point is that they, we need to know um, in this particular order, you know, uh, which one are close to each other, basically. And we're going to use a W, a symmetric matrix, to basically take into account the association structures of this particular set, which are close to each other. If you want to measure, for instance, the distance to, let's say, the centroids of the set or if you want to define a certain model, which is kind of, are, you are close to me, one or zero, if not, right? If you're not on neighborhood, right? right? So if you do this uh, and you basically take this distance, which is, is a, well, it can be a proper distance. It is in our case, but, but not always. Uh, if you are dealing with probability distribution, but in our case, it is a proper distance. Um, then the model takes exactly this form, which is basically the form of a, of a car model where you have the, the spatial structure of the cells uh, considered here, right? Uh, so there is correlation, and because there is correlation between the, the mass assigned to these sets, then you expect a, a smoothness in the behavior of the, the, yeah, in the prior behavior of the, the Coppola function, right? Uh, right. So, um, yeah, I don't want to go into all the discussion about Gaussian conditional autoregressive models here, but basically we are going to use in the examples that I'm going to show you the, the e car version of, of it, uh, in which the distance takes this particular form and the W is basically the adjacency matrix of the sets in this particular case, right? Um, right, so this is actually uh, the, the situation, right? Okay, that's it. So now we have a model uh, that we, we know the properties and we know how to define the prior. Ah, sorry, a comment that I forgot is that in any of the distance that I'm considering here, um, the interpretation of the parameters alpha and C0 remain the same. So which is nice. So C0 is gonna be the, the prior mode and alpha is the precision parameter, right? Which is cool. And, and if you take the, the E calibration, uh, then you those are the only two parameters that you need to deal with, right? Which is which is good. 
So now we have the likelihood, we have our, our prior, if you take any of these particular distances, but let's consider for the moment the ECAR because then something is reduced. Um, so how, how you do inferences here? And, and so we need to go into the details of the MCMC algorithm. I'm not gonna talk about how to update the parameters of the marginal distribution, which is not too difficult to do. I'm not gonna talk about, you know, how to, if you parameterize the copula, the centering copula function and create like a sort of hierarchical model. For instance, you, you could take your centering distribution of copula functions to be the Gaussian one. And, and then you specify a prior on the correlation matrices. This can be done, it's not so difficult to do. Um, but the key thing for this paper, which is the novel thing is how to do probably, right? The updating of the copula function, which is grid uniform. And, and, and to update that, we're gonna use a metropolitan hasting step. And, and the notation is C so, supra B is gonna represent, right? The, the current stage of the chain. And, and we are gonna come up with a proposal and the proposal, you, you can guess now what we're gonna do is basically to take the actual, uh, the current state of the chain and to do, right? Uh, random rectangular change to come up with the proposal. So we're gonna move very little, right? So the, of the copula, but the good thing is that with these movements, we can reach any other copula in principle, right? So, we, so, so because of this, we can cover the complete space, right? Uh, here we're taking only one, but you can take as many as you want, right? Uh, but the definition is the same, so I'm not, we're not gonna, I'm not gonna um, talk about the details because it's exactly the same definition that we did for the rectangular change. Okay. Um, yeah. And then when you do this, um, the acceptance uh, probability is not too difficult to compute. Actually, it's, it's a very simple form. Uh, you need to compute the distances between the centering and right the candidate and the current state of the chain. Uh, these differences here, which is very simple to do. And, and if D is the E car, then many things cancel, which is, which is nice. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's, that's the idea. So now we have a we have a model, right? Which in principle have it has decent properties, and, and we have a, an algorithm, an automatic algorithm, for 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 exploring the posterior distribution of the parameters, and uh, which is nice. Actually, in our experience with this algorithm, is that you get acceptance rates around 23, 25 percent without doing any any tweaking, which is nice. Uh, I'm going to show you how the model behaves, right? So um, for doing this, what I'm gonna do is, is different kind of uh, um, simulations. In one case, I'm gonna try to show you the effect of the sample size on the posterior distribution of the model. Um, so I'm gonna take uh, known copula models and I'm gonna generate data from them and try to estimate right, the, the, the copula function. And as you know, uh, showing the copula function is difficult. Um, because actually the, the plot behavior, if you want, is it goes to the extremes, it's really ugly. It's difficult to represent differences in, in the estimate and the true. So to, 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 to show you the results, what I'm gonna do is to represent the density, assuming fixed marginals, but I'm not trying to estimate the margin. So what I'm gonna do is to simulate data from a copula, but I'm gonna show you is to take the copula and to use a Gaussian zero one marginal distribution just to represent the joint distribution that we the true and the one that we're gonna estimate, okay? But it's just to show you uh, in a clear and better way, an easy way, how far or close the, 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 the posterior mean, for instance, of the, uh, under our model is, is close or not to the, to the true model, okay? So the first example is taking a, a parametric copula that even though it's parametric, it's very hard to estimate. Um, so which is the Clayton copula. Um, in, in all these copula functions, we, we choose the parametrization of them in order to have uh, the same 
values for uh, standard association parameters. I think that the tau here is kind of 0.5. I don't remember exactly. Right. So, and here you can see the true model and the posterior mean, right, of the under our model for sample size 500, 5,000, 10,000. And what you can clearly see is that when the copula, we're kind of capturing correctly, right? So this difficult behavior, actually this model is difficult even for based on parametric models, is very difficult to, to, to estimate. Um, but anyway, so, so I think that we're doing a decent job. Um, so if you, we take now a Gaussian, which is something standard, this is just to show that we are not overfitting the data when the Gaussian is appropriate. Uh, so you, you, you kind of get the same idea. So um, when the sample size increases, the posterior mean is closer, is closer to the true. Uh, and then the final example that I'm showing you here is, is the copula of a mixture of Gaussians, which is not a mixture of Gaussian copulas, but actually it's very hard to, which is one of the reasons why we do what we are doing <laughs> is because of the the copula function of a mixture model is very hard to compute and understand the properties is very difficult. So that's why would, that would be the natural approach for any person working in Bayesian non-parametric, which is to take a flexible model for the join and come up with the, the induced posterior distribution for the copula. That's not very easy because the computation of the copula under this model is very difficult, right? But here, just for the simulation, we did the, the effort to compute the, the the copula of a mixture of Gaussians, and, and then we see that when the sample size increases, our model is able to capture exactly what, what's going on, right? Um, this is, uh, yeah, okay, that's that. Um, so, so here is the posterior distribution. So the mean and, and quantize of the posterior distribution of the Hellinger distance between the model and the true model, right? Uh, has the sample size increases. And what you can see is that the posterior distribution of the Helling distance between the true and, uh, and, the, and the modern, right? It concentrate goes to zero and it concentrate, which is give, give us the idea that, you know, so there is a sort of, you know, good asymptotic properties that we need to study. But, but it's just to show you that the thing behaves okay. And, and so far I'm showing you that the thing works in, works in the way it should work, but we're not compared with anything. So what we do now, what I'm gonna show you now is the result of the comparison of our approach with the one of uh, Perron and Guillon, uh, which is the idea is similar in the sense that you take a partition, they only consider even partitions, um, right? And, but the model is different, it's kind of a, we call it flat, flat model here. So here I'm representing the result of a Monte Carlo study where um, this is the result of the true distribution, the value in this true distribution of the uh, Kendall tau, uh, because we, we take different degrees of association, different sample sizes, and, and we compute the mean integrated square error between the true and the proposal. This is not because I won or I like this particular measure to compute the, to evaluate, you know, the distance. I don't like this distance for probability distributions, but this is the one that they, Perron and Guillon use in their paper, and we wanted to compare with respect to them. That's why we are, we are doing exactly this here. And what you can see is that for the Gaussian model, the, the, the mistake is, is, is really, well, it's smaller than compared in comparison to the one that they obtain, right? So our model behaves better than them in, mo in most of the cases. Um, if you change the, the true model, this is the Gaussian, it's an easy one, the Gumbel. So with the same kind of association the structure, if you want, same sample sizes, uh, the conclusions are basically the same. We are still winning. Uh, we produce better results. And the, one of the reasons is that because we enforce basically it is a spatial, a spatial association of the sets, of the probability mass assigned to sets which are close to each other, right? And they don't do that, right? It's basically kind of an independent problem. So this is what we have. So basically in summary, we, we introduced, I think that is another class of, of couple of functions, grid uniform. Uh, it is good to know that they are dense. 
they are dense because you need to move the sets, right? The partitions basically. Um, and this is not what we are doing here. We are gonna, we are here in this particular application, we fix the, the partition. We take a kind of a large partition and we enforce correlation in the probability masses. But, but you can also try to do some, some other things like, you know, trying to locate in a smart, in a smart manner the partitions, the, the, element, the points of the partition to define sets where the mass is actually moving and having like larger sets where there is no math, there is no data. You can try to do things like this, but, but if you want to make an analogy with the non-parametric regression approaches here, we do kind of um, um, similar to put a lot of knots, right? And to force correlation between the coefficients which are associated to these transformations. Um, so I think that the properties of the models are cool. It's cool the fact that you can, you can find a family of transformation which is able to span the space. And this allow us to come up with a, an automatic algorithm, which works okay uh, for exploring the posterior distribution. And as I said before, uh, things that we are doing now is to try to come up with adaptive locations of the points that define the sets, um, different grid sites, that should be random too, right? So we should learn from the data and to study uh, uh, properties of the posterior distribution, asymptotic properties, because the prior, we know a little bit more, right? So, so that's it. That's, that's all, I, 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 all I have. So I don't know how much time left I have. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. Uh, well, thank you, Alejandro, for uh, this presentation. Uh, I think that we have, yeah, we, think we have some time to ask any questions. So if, if, if there are any questions or comments for Alejandro, uh, please turn on your mic and go ahead or write your question in the, in the chat. Hello. Hi, Alejandro. Uh, this is Sujit Ghosh. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, your ideas. Um, I was just wondering, I mean, uh, you mentioned about this uh, partitioning and the grid based approach. I mean, to what level of higher dimension this can be approached? I mean, have you tried like something like 10 dimensions and things like that? How does yeah. it work? Yeah, yeah. So no, we try, we try so, okay, so uh, thank you for your question because now I can talk about things that I forgot. So, so actually we try like kind of 50 and the thing works okay. And it, what is more surprising in this context to us at least is that, so the way we generate the candidate is moving, is a two dimensional transformation, right? So we, we, come, we choose basically four sets at the end of the day, it doesn't matter the dimensionality, we choose four sets and we move the mass, right? And yep. this is a kind of a little movement. And, and the good thing is that this little movement, even in high dimension works nicely. And what is also nice is that doing this two dimensional transformation of a really high dimensional thing, you can expand the space, right? So this is very surprising. It was very surprising to us. I, was, I couldn't believe the results because in, in principle you say, well, you are moving very little of the, the the candidate is something which is very close to what you have now, right? But the thing works really nicely, actually. So I, I wouldn't claim that we can do a thousand. I don't know, but but it is an advantage of you know of the the approaches that we have seen so far. So remember that Perron and Guillon were able to fit. It's only a bivariate copula, so we try ten, fifty. Actually, I think that a hundred and the thing works again. Okay. No, that's very interesting and encouraging. Thanks for the response. And uh, maybe I, just, if, I don't want to take everybody's time, but uh, uh, I've been interested in also uh, testing certain aspects of copula properties. Like, uh, I mean, they have been interested in testing something for like a positive quadrant dependence and things like that. Uh, I mean, those that I, I, I believe that your method might also be, uh, be able to extend to that. Uh, uh, that kind of things. And if you're interested, uh, we, we published one uh, uh, paper. Uh, it's not Bayesian uh, motivated, but uh, no, it's a still non-protein uh, approach. 
And if you're interested, I can post that on the chat. Uh, oh, great. Can... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Actually, we can try to do something together. Let us let us close this paper and then we will. We'll... <laughs> yeah, I, I think there has been a lot of interest in testing some of those aspects, especially from the frequentist one. But I think uh, the Bayesian approach might have an advantage towards there because you have the interposed tier distribution. Uh, and so that might be uh, useful. So I, I'll post one paper just uh, um, like a self promotion, but I, I think the ideas there, you might want to take a look at that, what I'm trying to talk about, about the dependent structure and testing for it. Great, thanks. Thanks, I appreciate that. Do we have any other question for Alejandro? Well, if not, let's thank Alejandro one more time. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you again for the invitation. It was nice to see. It is nice to see Wes, Fabricio. Probably I'm gonna meet something, someone, but and I, I, I wanna see you all in Chile, really. Hopefully in October. <laughs>